Well, well, well. <laughs> Hey there, it's Teddy coming to you from down in my record room with a brand new installment of the Vinyl Wing Ding. Yeah, the old Vinyl Orgy is no more. Uh, I'm just done fighting with YouTube over needle drops. However, I've got a really cool alternative for you. If you look down in the description, there is a link to a Dropbox folder where I have posted examples of all seven albums that I'll be showing today. So you can pause, check these things out, check them out later. They're also downloadable, so I think it should be pretty slick, pretty cool, and I'm happy to give you an alternative uh, to check out what I'll be talking about. Uh, for those of you who are wondering uh, where the hell I've been and you've not seen my participation in a session, with Mark and John and the Dr. Rhythm channel, or my interview with Kieran at the Needle Groove. Um, well, I have uh, been away from home, literally away from home for a year and a half working. I am back now and uh, very, very happy to be. Uh, I'll put a link down below as well to uh, the Dr. Rhythm uh, session and the interview with Kieran, if you've not seen those. So uh, the description will be packed with some goodies down there. Other than that, let's get to it. So what happens when a genius artist's 100th birthday is marked in the middle of a pandemic? Well, you listen. You listen and absorb this supreme artistry. And in this case, the genius is Charlie Parker, the person who altered the course of jazz from a dance music to an art music. And the irony here is what occurred during this concert in 1952. Uh, this is a 1983 release from Charlie Parker Records, uh, live at Rockland Palace, September 1952. Uh, it's a double album that makes up the entirety of the concert. And, you know, it's just amazing that there was a time and a place where a jazz artist could attain essentially rock star status. And that was Charlie Parker. He was a superstar in his lifetime. And it's no wonder uh, that he was asked to headline uh, a fundraiser event in Harlem in 1952 at the Rockland Palace. It was a fundraiser for a jailed African-American uh, New York City councilman, Benjamin Davis. Uh, it was an attempt to silence an African-American elected official's voice who also happened to be an avowed communist. So 3,000 people approximately showed up to this event to hear Charlie Parker's quintet along with a string section on some numbers. This was a time frame when Charlie Parker and strings was popular. And uh, by all accounts, uh, many of the attendees showed up to dance, to dance to bebop. And therein lies the irony. Uh, this album is uh, constructed of two different bootleg sources. And yes, part of that rock star status is that people were bootlegging uh, Charlie Parker appearances. And this is way before uh, Grateful Dead shows and things like this. And so this is constructed of two bootleg sources. And uh, yeah, the sound is, uh, is rough and substandard, however Charlie Parker's playing is so brilliant and focused, and he's on fire. And that's a bit unusual in 1952, as uh, some of his chops were slipping from time to time from his various addictions. And so maybe it was the 3,000 people, but man, he was spot on. He does a version here of Lester Leaps In that is so 
incendiary. It is blistering. And when I heard it, <laughs> my my jaw literally got a rug burn. I mean, it is something to marvel at. Along, I mean, his artistry is just on full display in this entire album. You know, sometimes, sometimes geniuses, uh, you know, they're they're so good. I don't know about you, but sometimes there's a there's a tendency to to almost shy away from them over time, and. Uh, I mean, I get that, uh, but when you reconnect with pure genius and pure virtuosity, it is just, it's not a disappointment, not a disappointment in any way. So happy birthday, Charlie Parker, man, you are a true genius and truly, uh, you know, it, it, in line with every honor that you deserve. So, one of many, many, many great Charlie Parker recordings. Charlie Parker at Rockland Palace, live at Rockland Palace, September 1952, on Charlie Parker Records, released in 1983. Well worth it. Well worth the time. Would you like to have a little fun? How about a plugged in trio with vast instantaneous musical knowledge that is just not afraid to go there? And there is a diverse improvisational place. Uh, this is a recording released this year on uh, Rare Noise Records. It's called Music from the early 21st century. And it's a collection of live recordings from uh, a small tour last year with the high velocity trio of the multifaceted New York drummer, Bobby Previtt, uh, the keyboard chameleon, Jamie Saft on Hammond B3, uh, Fender Rhodes and Mini Moog, and the infamous guitar scientist, Nels Klein. And these are thick, chunky, nasty, improvisational jams that at first blush live in a space somewhere between the Tony Williams lifetime and Deep Purple. And I'm not kidding. There's also a nod to Drone. There's a nod to Electronica. There's even a dash of Kraut Rock. So it is uh, quite the musical smorgasbord. And these guys have such vast knowledge and they lock on to ideas quickly and they switch on a dime just as quickly uh, as they are thumbing through their individual musical Rolodexes. It's just really fun, impressive stuff. So if you're interested in some uh, musical genre bending improvisations mixed with some uh, dirty electricity. Uh, I urge you to check this one out. Yeah. Sometimes having something fun is just what's required and what's needed. It's music from the early 21st century with Bobby Previtt, Jamie Saft, and Nels Klein on the Rare Noise Records label. Yep, fun. Have you ever dreamt of what it might sound like if Ornette Coleman and Eric Dolphy played together? Well, it was right under my nose this whole time. I had no idea. This 1961 Atlantic release called Jazz Abstractions is as much a marketing shit show as it is one of the finest examples of third stream music you'll ever hear. I mean, <laughs> it says, John Lewis presents contemporary music, jazz abstractions, compositions by Gunther Schuller and Jim Hall. Well, the reality is John Lewis doesn't even play on this record. He's presenting it, whatever that means. What this really is, is a Gunther Schuller record. Gunther Schuller, 
the composer, arranger, and educator. He put together this amazing one-off group uh, that included the likes of Orna Coleman, Eric Dolphy, uh, Bill Evans, Jim Hall, uh, Scott LaFerro on bass. And it is just an amazing, stunning example of his concept of combining jazz and classical music together. Uh, there's a Gunther Schuller composition. There is a Jim Hall composition. And then there are variations on John Lewis's Django and Thelonious Monk's Crisscross that Gunther Schuller arranged. And uh, the, the uh, crisscross variation is where you'll find uh, Coleman and Dolphy uh, just doing their thing, going for it uh, on alto sax and bass clarinet, respectively. And it is indeed a dream come true. But the real star is this third stream concept of Gunther Schuller's and, uh, you know, combining uh, jazz elements with classical elements. It's both heady and swinging. It's brilliantly thought out and executed. And uh, you might think it could be a bit of a train wreck trying to mix these two genres. It is not. There are no ambiguities here uh, whatsoever. Um, so once you get past the confusing clutter on the cover, this is an album that is deserving of much greater attention and affirmation. It is just really a standout uh, in the third stream subgenre of jazz. John Lewis presents contemporary music, jazz abstractions, compositions by Gunther Schuller and Jim Hall on Atlantic Records from 1961. Just brilliant. When you boil music down to its most basic, uh, foundational, raw essence, for me, it's all about the human voice. And this is arguably one of the greatest pieces of music ever written for the human voice by the great Russian composer Sergei Rachmaninoff. It's called All Night Vigil, uh, otherwise known as Vespers. This is a 1973 release, uh, two record box set on the Melodia label. Now, All Night Vigil was written for an a cappella choir, and it's based on sacred chants from the Russian Orthodox Church. And Rachmaninoff was obviously inspired as he whipped this out in two weeks. And it was premiered in Russia in 1915 during a period of uh, immense political turmoil. And it is filled with such lyrical beauty and harmonic complexities, it just goes straight to my soul. Now, I am not, by any stretch of the imagination, a religious person. And they're obviously singing in Russian, so the words are meaningless to me, but it speaks to me in such volumes of beauty that... Uh, yeah, it really transcends into more of a spiritual space for me. Uh, it is just, it's just fantastic. Now, as the Russian Revolution took root, this was deemed as religious music. It was banned. It was put on the shelf for 50 years. So in 1965, it was finally recorded. Uh, this is that 65 recording. Uh, for uh, many, this is considered to be kind of the gold standard recording, maybe not from an audiophile perspective, but one of the uh, aspects that Rachmaninoff really wanted uh, in this choir was the inclusion of some freakishly low bass voices. And they're here. They are evident, and especially if you have a subwoofer, they will uh, be very, very apparent. 
Um, it is quite uh, amazing stuff. So if you're looking for some music to uh, transcend just momentarily all of the weirdnesses that we're uh, collectively dealing with these days, the naked power and beauty of the human voice is certainly one way to do it. Uh, this is 1973 release on Melodia called Vespers. Um, two record box set from the brilliant, brilliant composer Sergei Rachmaninoff. Yeah, it just emanates. Wonderful stuff. So, who is Archie Shep to you? Is he a fire spitting free jazzer? Or possibly a swinging R&B honker? Or maybe a soulful balladeer? Well, the reality is you would all be correct as he has been all of those things and more since the 1960s. And during the 1970s, Shep began to look more and more in the rearview mirror and do his spin on Afrocentric musical traditions, both in intimate and expansive settings. Uh, this is a 1978 Italian Horo release, double album, that is aptly named The Tradition. It's four sidelong cuts. Uh, one is a self pen number called Hooray for Mal. There are two Duke Ellington numbers. And he even looks back at himself by re-recording uh, the Cal Massey number, Things Have Got to Change. Um, it is a trio setting uh, with drummer Clifford Jarvis, uh, Cameron Brown on bass, and Archie Shep plays tenor, soprano, and upright piano. And the album flows between nods to bebop, uh, to blues, to ballads, and of course John Coltrane. But being a trio setting, all three of these musicians are able to just brightly shine. Clifford Jarvis, uh, having been a Sun Ra Orchestra alumnus, he is just very skilled at taking on anything that comes his way and working with it just seamlessly. Cameron Brown, just one of the most... Uh, underappreciated, underrecognized bass players, and I'm telling you on this album there are times he is just simply the star. And Archie Shep, in his uh, unique way, who never plays it straight, um, he puts a playful avant-garde spin even on the most uh, traditional of numbers, and uh, I just love it, and it's just, you know, who he is. It's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, this album uh, in 1978 is occurring just a little bit before uh, Shep recorded those brilliant duet albums with Horace Parlin on Steeplechase, but it's beginning to uh, edge in that direction. Thankfully, uh, this album has been recently re-released. It's available, and I do urge you to check it out. It is just brilliantly solid, well-executed, well-played music. And, uh, yeah, I love it. The Tradition by Archie Shep on the Horo label from 1978. How about Sun Ra, Charles Mingus, Fela Kuti, and John Coltrane's Africa Brass put in a powerful Norwegian blender? Well, that's exactly what you get here with Gard Nilsson's Supersonic Orchestra. The name of the album is, if you listen carefully, the music is yours. It's a double LP uh, released this year on Odin Records. Uh, it's a live recording. And Gard Nilsson is a drummer 
who has put together an immensely powerful 16-piece group, and it's anchored with intertwined rhythms of three bass players, three drummers, and a plethora of horns. This is a real deal, inside-out piece of brilliance. Uh, there are compositions, st structured, tight compositions, that burst into fantastic solos and uh, often group free-for-alls. This is just very focused group think in contrast with beautiful individual points of view. Um, it just is a wonderful example of some jazz that's happening over in Scandinavia. Uh, I, I love this. As I said earlier, there are references to musical Sherpas who came before, but in the end, this group really becomes its own exuberant animal. And exuberance is just dripping on this album. The joyfulness that came through my speakers was palpable and to a point that there were times that I actually got up out of my chair out of sheer joy and this was not to change the record side I was just moved that incredibly and so excited by this record um, I would place this uh, in the running for album of the year uh, I think it's that good and uh, just that immense and uh, I really do urge you to uh, give this a shot. Again, it's uh, from 19, how about 2020, um, on the Odin label, Gard Nilsson Supersonic Orchestra. If you listen carefully, the music is yours, and truer words have never been spoken. <laughs> You know, there are times, uh, rare times, that a recording from over 50 years ago uh, has shown itself to be quite relevant and reflective of current events. And I'm talking about the 1965 recording Alabama Blues by J.B. Lenore. And in reality, I'm talking about two albums, this and the 1966 follow-up called Down in Mississippi. Now, J.B. Lenore was an electric bluesman from Chicago uh, who uh, recorded for Chess Records, amongst other independent Chicago labels. He had a couple of minor hits. You may have heard of one uh, called Mama Talk to Your Daughter. Um, he was known to be quite a showman, oftentimes sporting a uh, rather snazzy zebra-inspired tuxedo. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as opposed to Muddy Waters, who had a very deep and resonant voice, uh, J.B. Lenore uh, had a high-pitched voice that could easily cut through all of the clutter. But it's these 1965 and 1966 sessions under the direction of the great Willie Dixon that are so starkly different. Uh, they are personal sessions with... Lenore only on acoustic guitar and sometimes accompanied by the drummer Fred Bellow. Um, they're clean, vivid recordings. But it's the content that is so unusual for the time. It, it was just not common for a blues artist to write material um, about current social and political events uh, in the mid-1960s. Uh, Lenore here is commenting on uh, the civil rights movement. He's commenting on the Vietnam War. He's commenting on uh, life in general as an African-American in the United States at that time. And I find that there is this laser beam connection to the Black Lives Matter movement today. And... It's both confirming 
and ultimately maddening that very little has changed uh, since then. Um, you know, now don't get me wrong. Some of the material on here um, is, you know, some really cool uh, boogie down type stuff. So it's it's not all in this vein, but they are. Uh, it, it's clearly the feature uh, of these two albums. And when these were recorded at the time, there is no way, no way that an American company was going to touch these. This just would have been too volatile. Um, so originally released in Germany in 1966, and then later reissued here on the German L&R label in 1979 and then 1980. Now, since then, the Library of Congress has uh, recognized uh, these recordings for their significance. And, you know, that's great. But what really needs to be recognized is the content of these records they need to move beyond vinyl. They need to be put into action. We need real change in this country, and that's what needs to be recognized and dealt with. It's far, far, far past time. And so these are immensely, immensely significant recordings. And I just think they're beautiful, beautifully emotional, and they state everything that they need to state very, very clearly. J.B. Lenore from 1965 and 66 on the German L&R label, Alabama Blues, and down in Mississippi. Well, that wraps up this wingding. Um, I hope that you uh, enjoyed and uh, will take advantage of the sound uh, samples that uh, you can open up and or download. Please uh, drop me a line. Comments, you know. I'm here. I'll respond. I'm into it. I want the discussion. So, you know, have at it. I'd love to hear from you. And uh, as you uh, may remember, if I can, I want you to do what you can to keep it in the groove. And I'll see you next time. And please wear a mask.